Good morning from London and good morning from London and Zurich. My name is Stephen Cairns. I'm the director of the Future Cities Lab. And this is a research unit of ETH Zurich. It's located here in Singapore. So it's my pleasure to welcome you, um, whatever your time zone, to this session on urban design and the technological shift in transportation. So all cities have composed of forms, buildings, infrastructure, plumbing, and flows, water, electricity, and transportation. Yet forms and flows tend to be studied and managed and practiced in different ways with different methods. So by bringing urban design and transportation together into the same title, this is already quite an interesting statement of intent. It announces that the two, these two fundamental aspects of cities need to be considered together. So I'm excited to say that the three speakers who will contribute to the program uh, today um, are energetic exponents of this holistic approach to cities. Now the rise of, COVID, of the COVID pandemic itself, a kind of form and flow phenomenon, uh, makes this approach even more important and even more crucial. So the first speaker is Dr. Tanvi Maheshwari, and I take special pleasure in emphasizing Dr. as Tanvi has recently complete, completed her PhD and this may well be the first public event where she can use that title formally. So we're really delighted about that. Uh, Dr. Maheshwari is a researcher in the Engaging Mobility Team at the Future Cities Lab. She trained as an architect in the School of Planning and Architecture in Delhi, uh, and then specialized in urban design with a master's from the University of California, Berkeley, then completed her PhD from ETH Zurich here in Singapore. Then the second speaker is Professor Stephen Marshall, He's Professor of Urban Morphology and Urban Design at the Bartlett School of Planning at UCL. And he works on urban morphology and street layout and their relationships to urban design, coding, and planning. And he's written or edited several books, including Streets and Patterns, Land Use and Transport, Cities, Design, Evolution, and Urban Coding and Planning. In my own experience, I often use Streets and Patterns as my go-to book for those who are starting to think about urban design at a postgraduate uh, level or in a, in, a, in a more serious researcher way. So it's a very important body of work. Um, the third speaker is Professor Kai Axhausen. He's the Chair of Transport Planning at ETH Zurich and Principal Investigator of the Engaging Mobility Team here in FCL. His work measures and models travel behavior and takes many forms, including micro simulation of travel behavior and the associated impacts such as accessibility and parking, and everyday travel choices. Again, in my own experience, I've got to know Kai's work through the agent-based models that he and his team developed using the open source MatSim software here in Singapore. And that's been very influential in the shaping of the FCL program, but also in shaping some of the key debates around Singapore's planning futures. So we'll hear first from Tanvi on some of the key aspects of her thesis in about 30 minutes. And then from Stephen and Kai, who will in turn offer 15 minute commentaries and will thicken the discussion with additional themes of their own. Um, we have 30 minutes for discussion um, following those presentations. So please use the chat function to compose your questions as you go along. Um, I will do my best to keep time and I will also come back to those questions um, and, and activate uh, our, our panelists and presenters to, to address them. If we don't get a chance to uh, uh, address all of the questions, we'll certainly try and collate them and maybe circulate responses uh, in the coming days. Uh, one final thing is to say, uh, I think the event is being recorded. Um, so don't ask a question if you don't want to be recorded, uh, but we will certainly uh, look at your questions and make sure that they are represented properly. So with that, thank you very much. Uh, and I now um, invite Tanvi to open up the session with her presentation. Tanvi. Hello, good evening. Uh, so I'm very excited to be presenting this webinar today. It's, uh, as Stephen said, my first public presentation since my uh, doctoral defense. And today I will be examining some of the challenges that I studied um, in my uh, thesis regarding the latest technological innovations in transportation and what it means for the field of urban design and planning. I will also discuss how these technologies can support innovative urban models in the future. Now, my interest in the subject was triggered by the rise of uh, automated vehicles in the last few years. So 
the idea of the driverless car itself is not exactly new. Uh, since the 1920s, we can see concept AVs. But what has changed now is the emergence of of other enabling technologies in parallel that can finally turn EVs from a concept to reality. These technologies include things like uh, the rapid rise of ride sharing platforms, uh, electric vehicles, and also the increasing connectivity we have today with sensors and 5G. Now, all of these technologies uh, support each other and they have a potential to converge and fundamentally shift travel patterns. The pace of growth of these technologies signals to us as urbanists that we must respond to them. Uh, but so far, these, this discussion has been dominated by a technocentric point of view. Now, this is problematic because new technologies have far reaching impacts on cities. Just consider what the private car did to transform our cities. This image that you see here is the Futurama exhibit from Geddes. Uh, this and many of the images from the 1920s and 50s all take the car as the centerpiece of their futuristic urban vision. And these type of images hold the implicit assumption that a car can beneficially transform cities. It's this belief that has led to uh, wide, large-scale, car-oriented development around the world, like in Singapore, as you can see in this image here. So much so that today we are deeply entrenched in a system of automobility. This is a powerful self-expanding pattern of development of both society and urban form that is extremely hard to reverse. So will the technological shift in transportation further this pattern of development or does it have the potential to dismantle the system of automobility? When I look at academic studies on the subject of how the technological shift will impact cities, I find mixed results. So the impacts vary greatly across different urban contexts and different time spans. There's a real danger that if we strive for short term predictable benefits, we might in fact uh, have detrimental consequences in the long term. Now there are many driving forces that will steer the impact in either direction. For us today, urban design and planning is a key concern because urban form and transport flows have a complex two-way relationship, like Stephen set it up in the beginning. Uh, changes in transportation technologies can alter urban form, and we can use urban design and interventions to influence travel behavior. So how can we harness this two-way relationship to steer the impacts of the shift in a desirable direction. Of course, I'm not the only one who's asking this question. Uh, in the past few years, many practitioners, including some of you in the audience, have proposed a wide uh, variety of design strategies to harness the benefits of ADs. But often these strategies are mutually contradictory. For instance, street design. This is one of the most widely debated areas. Should we reclaim street space and give them back to pedestrians and cyclists? Should we completely segregate pedestrians and cyclists from AVs? Or should we just mix them all up together on a shared street? How do we decide which strategy to employ? Now, I've proposed a three-step process to answer this question in my research. First, we identify the questions of interest through stakeholder consultations. In the case of this research, the stakeholders were a group of experts and policy makers who were involved in the L2NIC 2 v project, which a grant that funded my research. So once we identify, uh, once we do the stakeholder consultations, we can identify which aspects of urban form do we want to investigate further. So in this case, we picked network design, pickup drop-off points design, or PUDO, parking design, and intersection design. Now, these are my four design experiments. What's a design experiment? It is nothing but in a, an ensemble of models driven by one design question. So instead of constructing one hyper-realistic model to accurately predict future transport flows, what I do is construct an ensemble of alternative models where each is flawed in a different way. So this can help us compare, it can help us understand trade-offs, and understand the structural uh, relationship between urban form and transport flows uh, so that we can make an informed decision. 
For example, in these experiments, I use an ensemble of three models. So for intersection, let's say, what if all intersections are signalized? What if all intersections have overhead uh, pedestrian bridges? What if all intersections have scramble crossings? The, the answer to this what, what if question comes from agent-based simulations. So we use agent-based simulations to assess each model and then informed by the results of these experiments, we can then create our response to the technological shift. So let me show you how I operationalized uh, this framework through an empirical study that I conducted for new towns in Singapore. Over 80% of Singapore population resides in HDB built new towns. New towns have been described as uh, an experiment in an urban laboratory because they're built often on a blank slate and based on very specific design and planning principles. These principles are keenly followed by other high density cities in this region. This is why the evolution of the Newtown model interests me as an urbanist. I'm concerned with how the prevailing Newtown model can be modified in response to the technological shift in transportation. To do this, I create a fictional Newtown so I parametrically developed this Newtown prototype where I would conduct my experiments. And then I populate this with new mobility options. So we have the traditional bus and MRT, the mass rapid transit, and then I also add automated and demand responsive options. So the operative word here is demand responsive transit or DRT. This functions similar to an Uber pool or a grab share type of service, but the vehicle sizes vary from four seaters to up to 20 seaters. So once I have this, I simulate the resulting transport flows using Sketch Maxim. This is an agile multi-agent transportation simulation framework developed by Ordonia Sinfuri at Singapore ETH Center. So once we have all these pieces in place, we can now look at my experiment results. The first one is how do we design the street network for these new transportation systems? Here my ensemble consists of three types of networks. The first is loops. This is the current convention in new towns in Singapore. You have minimal through block links and a lot of cul-de-sacs. The second is a much more connected grid. And the third is a super block, which has the exact same network topology as the grid, but there are high speed peripheral streets surrounding very low speed internal uh, streets. That's about 10 kilometers per hour. Now, just by looking at these configurations visually, we can intuitively draw some conclusions. For example, when you have a very disconnected network, then shared DRT vehicles would have to make a lot of detours. Also in the simulation results, we see that the mean travel distance and detour ratio is the highest for loops. Naturally, if you have long detours, DRT would become less efficient and they should become less attractive. This is also the case uh, in the simulation result. DRT is used the least in the loops. In fact, uh, if you go further into this, you would see that even four six-seater DRTs don't work at all for this type of network. We had to employ larger 10 to 20-seater DRTs to make this network function. So we can say that first and last mile connectivity is a big issue in these hierarchical uh, disconnected networks that you have in new towns. And DRT is not an easy fix for this problem. Okay, on the other extreme, we have the grid. This is highly connected, so we have a uh, shorter detour ratio and uh, shorter mean distance traveled. This, of course, makes it more attractive uh, for DRT, but it's not as attractive as I would have expected. And this is because, as you can see here, taxis are very attractive in grids. You use a lot more taxis in grid than other networks so much so that they take away uh, trips even from private cars. So private cars are also not used as much in grid. Now, why is this uh, happening? Uh, the reason for this is the new pricing dynamics that I've introduced uh, or assumed due to automation. For more details, I would highly recommend that you read this publication by Professor Axhausen's research group. But for now, I can say that when there is no congestion and you eliminate driver cost, Taxis can be even cheaper than private cars, especially when you have very short trips, which is the case in the grid. 
This means that grids uh, generate a lot of VKT. VKT is vehicle kilometers traveled. In this presentation, I use VKT as a proxy for traffic-based emissions. So since private modes are used a lot more in the grid, you have high VKT. It's clear that a well-connected grid works only when you supplement it with a well-designed active mobility network. Otherwise, the cost benefit of automation may even encourage more private vehicle use. One of the surprising findings for me in this experiment was that the network, the superblocks, perform well on almost all metrics. So if you remember, the grid and the superblock had the exact same network topology. The only thing I changed was a non-physical dimension of Urban Forum, which is the speed. And look at the big difference it has made. We see that private modes are used less in superblocks and shared modes are flourishing. DRT is used the most in superblocks compared to other modes. And not only is it used more, but you can see that the total travel time is the shortest. Now, I want you to observe this carefully because it's interesting to note that we designed the superblocks to be slow. I limited most of the links to 10 kilometers per hour. This means that the overall network is also slow. In the simulation results, we can see that the peak speed that we observe, peak hour speed for superblocks, is almost 30% slower than the other two networks. So how is the travel time for DRT the fastest here? If you look at the uh, average peak speed to free speed ratio, it's the best in superblock. In simple words, uh, what this means is that superblocks are slow, but they're not congested. So it seems that by slowing down the, uh, some links in the system, we are allowing the system to rebalance in a way that the inequity between the travel time for private modes versus shared mode is reduced. Next, I want to move on to my PUDO or pickup drop-off point experiment. Here also, I'm testing three different conditions. What if we provide many pickup drop-off points? So every house has access to one within 150 meters of walking distance. What if you have a very few PUDO points? So 300 meters walk shed. And then finally, what if you have on-street pickup drop-off on every street where you have more than one lane in one direction and you do not have a transit corridor? So unlike the network experiment, experiment where superblocks really stood out, here we don't have one winner. Logically, when I provide uh, many PUDO locations here, you're able to reach your pickup drop-off point quickly, you're able to access a DRT more easily, this should make DRT more attractive. Also in the simulation result, you can see that uh, DRT is used a lot more when uh, you have many PUDOs compared to when you have few. But when you have fewer PUDOs, bus usage is higher. So what happens when you're using fewer PUDOs is that you're consolidating a lot of people in, a few, in fewer locations. So you also have better ride consolidation. As you can see, when you have fewer PUDOs, the vehicles are fuller uh, compared to when you have many. This means that when you have many pickup drop-off points, there are a lot of emptier vehicles moving around, which generates a lot of VKT, traffic-based emissions. So clearly both st uh, strategies have their pros and cons, but on-street PUDO combines the best of both worlds. Here, average travel time and waiting times are very short. They're even shorter than when you have many PUDOs. And uh, we have fuller uh, fuller vehicles. The distance space average occupancy for DRT is almost the same as when you have few PUDOs. Of course, uh, in on-street option, you are reducing the street capacity by quite a bit because every time a vehicle stops to drop off a passenger, you're blocking a lane. So this does reduce the street, uh, the peak speeds. You can see the average peak speed is lower for on-street uh, PUDOs. But I think uh, this loss is not is very small compared to the gains we are making in all the other areas, especially space efficiency and also the cost of introducing new infrastructure. I also reached the same conclusion when I did the parking experiment for on-street parking. On-street was much more preferable even though uh, we reduced the peak speed slightly. 
Another surprising finding for me was that when you have fewer Pudo locations, they are used more efficiently over the course of the day. So logically, if I provide fewer locations for pickup drop-off, like here, more vehicles are arriving to each location, which means that we need to design for higher capacity. But uh, if you look at the difference between the peak hour arrivals for many and few Pudos, it's not that big. Of course, it's larger for few, but not by much. But the average daily dwell and fuse is double when you have few Pudos. What this means is that um, the vehicle arrivals at these pickup drop-off points are spread out better throughout the course of the day. This is why I developed a Pudo design matrix so that we can take into consideration temporal use of space. Each of the points that you see here, like Pudo locations, can be mapped onto a scatter plot. The scatter plot is the maximum with the maximum dwell length used uh, at any time of the day at the Pudo versus the average dwell length used over the course of the day, 24 hours. Now, I can divide this scatter plot into four quadrants. Each quadrant is a Pudo type. So on the top right, you have busy Pudos. These have very high vehicle turnover rate. They are also the new centralities of our neighborhood. So they definitely require new dedicated infrastructure and maybe also other facilities. But on the bottom left, we have the opposite. You have minor Pudos and then we can accommodate these Pudos just on street facilities. The top left that you see here, these are inefficient Pudos. You have a large number of vehicles coming at peak hour and then most of the day they remain empty. This needs to be investigated further. So we can go back to the master plan and then we can see where these inefficiencies are coming from. Is it because of where they are located? Is it because of the land use around it? So we can use this matrix as a tool to design kudos. Similarly, I developed some design recommendations from the results of all four design experiments. And then I operationalized these recommendations to create my urban design response to the technological shift for a fictional HDB new town. Now this response is built upon these experiments, but it's purely conjectural. I will present this to you in three stages. We have retrofitting interventions in the short term. We have more structural changes in the midterm. And then I have a vision for a more radical transformation to a post-road city in the long term. So in the short term, in the next five years, we can expect that partially automated vehicles will be commercially available, but the streets would largely be dominated by human driven vehicles. So we have two primary concerns in the short term, the poor first last mile connectivity in the new towns and future infrastructure redundancy. To counter this, we need to take, uh, we need to make improvements in both transit service and transit access. So what we can do is we can start by deploying large 10 to 20 seater DRT, demand responsive transit, as an additional mode of public transit in new towns. Now they can be implemented on dedicated transit lane and these transit lanes can be buffered from the rest of the traffic to allow us to maximize the efficiency of automated vehicles. We should also use as far as possible existing bus stop uh, and infrastructure for Pudos and uh, not construct new parking bays and Pudo bays. We also need to undertake a comprehensive redesign of the pedestrian network to improve the transit access. In the next 15 years, vehicle sharing and DRT usage are expected to pick up. Now this could cannibalize traditional public transit ridership and this could encourage taxi use. So our goal in the midterm is to maximize the ridership of shared vehicles and then promote them as a complement to traditional transit like buses and MRT. To do this, we must diversify our DRT fleet. So in addition to the large vehicles, we must deploy smaller, more agile four seaters, six seaters uh, in the neighborhood. And then in parallel, we need to make the network topology more connected so that the smaller vehicles don't have to make big detours. We still should maintain the transit corridors for bigger vehicles, but to discourage the use of private vehicles 
we can reduce the speed limits on the streets that have no transit corridor. We can further improve the DRT access by providing more on-street uh, options for pickup and drop off. In the street section, you see that when we reduce the speed limits and when reduce the lane widths, we are able to reclaim more space for other users of the road. Now in the long term, I invite you to stretch your imagination a bit. So let's say we have 100% level five automation. We have B2B, B2I connectivity. We have very high rates of vehicle sharing. This is our opportunity to finally try to dismantle the system of automobility. But first, to do that, we must question the concept of the road. The road is the biggest enabler of the system of automobility. We sometimes use the word road and street interchangeably, but they imply different meanings. A street is often seen as a public space with a place making function and a road is more like an artery with a movement function. Now the place and movement function always seem to be in conflict with one another, but I think the technological shift can remove this conflict and allow the two functions to coexist. Electric AVs could be quieter, cleaner, lighter than a traditional automobile, so they would be less disruptive in a shared space like this. We can also expect better safety compliance from AVs than from human driven vehicles in these types of spaces. And if shared vehicles are extensively deployed and centrally managed, we can also uh, better optimize the performance of the entire network and the speed and the routing. All of this together can support a new post road city that is dominated by shared modes and shared spaces. Now I have designed one post road city block based on a super block inspired network. We have high speed, low friction peripheral street. Low friction means that there's very few points of conflict between the different users of the street. So there, are, this is the street section. There are three segregated parts. There's platoon, transition and access lanes and the maximum allowable speed varies by lane from 25 kilometers per hour to 90 kilometers per hour. I have provided underground pedestrian crossings because I want to avoid the platoons stopping frequently so that I can maximize their environmental benefits. Any vehicle, large or small, can drop off and pick up passengers in these designated Prudhoe bays by transitioning over to the access lane. But smaller DRTs, eight-seaters, six-seaters, can move further inside the neighborhood on these access streets. This is what an access street looks like. This also has clearly marked traffic lanes and pedestrian lanes, but this is a medium friction street because the vehicles have to stop often at pedestrian priority inter uh, intersections. Now, even smaller vehicles like taxi pods or service vehicles or private vehicles they can move further inside the neighborhood on high friction shared streets. High friction means that there is a high level of conflict between all the users on the street. So I've limited the maximum speed to only 10 kilometers per hour. And finally, pedestrians can seamlessly move through the entire neighborhood through these uh, courtyard like open spaces, uh, taking the shortest route possible to their destination. This gives me uh, this type of open space with a high friction pathway within a large open space framed by buildings in this new type of urban configuration. Now, this type of park-like car-free landscape that I pictured here, this has been criticized historically because they can fragment the urban fabric and they create lifeless spaces. In the context of Singapore, such a configuration is not entirely out of place. We can see a similar concept reflected in the existing HTB estates with large void deck brown plane. Void decks are an integral part of the culture of HTB living. They are open plan, flexible spaces on the ground floor that host everything from convenience stores to traveling exhibitions, weddings, and funerals. Learning from the void deck, we can see that the success of this post-road city hinges on an active ground plane 
private cars are detrimental to this goal because you know the fast convenient travel that the car offers it has already disintegrated our places of work living and shopping into office parks and suburbs and strip malls what the technological shift can help us with is to reverse this by allowing a tighter integration between different activity spaces so when we reclaim more space uh, from the cars in the post road city it gives us room to inject new activities into neighborhoods and activate the district. In the post road city, I've designed the ground plane as entirely non residential and also multifunctional. So, in my parking and pudo experiments, it was clear that monofunctional spaces can be very inefficient over time. And also, in an extreme situation like the ongoing pandemic, these inefficiencies, inefficiencies are highly magnified. This is why going forward, we must embrace multifunctionality and flexibility in the design of activity spaces. I provide fixed use spaces to anchor the periphery of the block in red and then more flexible, uh, flexibly zoned non-residential inside the block in blue. DRT can uh, help us with this because it can support uh, flexible zoning by improving accessibility inside the block and quickly adapting to changes in demand. Now, finally, I want to conclude by summarizing five learnings, uh, five general principles of urbanism that I took away from this research. The first is that we must reconsider the road. We should instead think about designing streets that incorporate both movement and place function simultaneously. Next, we must consider the temporal use of space and not just its physical dimension and here I'm pointing towards urban design as a discipline, because we need to move away from a purely spatial view, given the increasing complexities that in the urban system. We also need to pay more attention to walkability. And here I'm talking about the discipline of transport planning, because transport models must incorporate a much finer grained description of pedestrian flows, so that we're able to see the relationship between urban design and how it can influence transport, transport flows. We also need to embrace slow mobility. We don't always have to see it as low mobility or congestion. And finally, we need innovative design solutions for seamless inter intermodal connections. If we want to diversify our mobility options in the future, seamlessness is crucial. So can we design, can urban design steer the impacts of the shift? Can we dismantle the system of automobility? I hope we all know that uh, if you replace one technology with another technology, you do not dismantle a complex system. But physical change can support social change. That's the role of urban design. Urban design can steer the impacts, but not through a new urban model for the future or a blueprint. Urban design can help us define our goals and intents, which tend to remain fairly stable. And then we need to better understand how our design actions influence these goals to clarify a course of action towards the future. Now, this understanding is only possible if we embrace new planning tools, methods and procedures that go beyond the traditional discipline, uh, design discipline. And with that, I want to end my presentation by just thanking the team uh, that I work together with, without whom this work wouldn't have been possible. Peter Sekuin Biu, the team behind Spatial DRT and Sketch Madsen, and all the collaborators involved in the L2 and IC project. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Tanvi. Um, one of the great things about Zoom is that we can all gather together from across the world. One of the downsides of Zoom is that we can't applause and say thank you in the normal way. So I'm, we're, I'm really disappointed, but if you do, you know, we can use the function and simply applause in that kind of rather lame way. Um, so thank you to uh, Anne Feenstra and Alex Erard who posted questions already and a couple of others. Uh, we please um, keep an eye on the, on the, on the chat function. Um, please post comments or reactions there. Uh, and while you do that, um, Tanvi can keep an eye on those. We can start to compose some thoughts. Uh, but I think here now we'll, we'll hand over to Professor Stephen Marshall. We're delighted to welcome him from what looks like a lovely spot outside London um, somewhere. Stephen, over to you.
thank, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. I'm just going to uh, try and share my screen now. Um, if you hold on a second. So um, th uh, thank you for the uh, invitation to join uh, this uh, event. Um, as you mentioned at the beginning, this is mainly a reflection um, on following from and thinking beyond uh, what uh, Tanvi was presenting. So I, I was delighted to, uh, to, to uh, uh, have a view of Tanvi's work. And um, as I said to you earlier, uh, Tanvi, um, it's the kind of work I was kind of waiting for. <laughs> uh, there's been much thought about transport and different transport modes and new technologies. And so much of it has been purely on the transport side, which is great. Uh, but thinking through the, the urban connections, uh, it, I think has been under undersold or underthought, shall we say. Um, so I was delighted to see this. And as, as you already said, it is a two-way relationship. So the urban form can, and urban design can influence how people move and behave and uh, use transport modes in cities, as we all know. Um, and new modes of transport can also influence uh, new kinds of urban forms uh, and urban designs. So um, I'm just going to, uh, I've got a few slides here which slightly reflect on and, and go tangentially, uh, perhaps beyond uh, the uh, preceding presentation. So I called it Reflections on Future Transport and Urban Form. Um, I mean, I think we're in, we live in exciting times. <laughs> we perhaps live in interesting times, as the saying goes. Um, but I, I, like I always tell my students, there's never been a more exciting time to be a transport planner. So um, those who are coming into the profession or start starting in their careers, uh, I think it's a it's a brilliant time to be around. Um, I, I I seem to remember when I was originally studying transport, you know, things like bus lanes were about the the height of uh, the, the height the height of excitement, um, or maybe even reintroducing trams, which it, it, which had which had uh, which were an old technology, simply being reinstated. Um, and yeah, I mean, it feel does feel as if we're at a historic threshold of new transport modes and and urban forms. Um, like in a sense, um, nothing quite like this has happened to cities or the potential since um, since the 60s or the 50s, depending depending where where you were. Um, the, the potential for new modes of transport, new forms of movement, driverless transport, um, and different ways of sharing um, and different uh, technologies and vehicles uh, connected or interacting with each other. I think uh, it just feels as if we're on a verge of something quite important and significant and new. And a lot of this is already, we've just seen in, in the previous uh, presentation. Um, in fact, when I first came across this work, it kind of reminded me of Traffic in Towns, which um, it, a, a government document uh, from the UK in 1963, uh, although it, it, you know, it's quite been quite an influential document in other parts of the world as well, and similar work in other parts of the world, when in the 1960s, people started to think, well, what if we redesigned our cities to accommodate the, the, the motor car? Um, and in fact, we can see pedestrians are catered for here. Uh, and there's even a bus still trundling along the streets at a, a, a pickup point or a transit stop, depending how we, how we call it. So th this was a, a visionary document in its day, I suppose, but it invites us to reflect on new transport modes and the relations with urban form. But before doing that, we can just very briefly remind ourselves, of, of course, of cities that had grew up in, in the age of when, uh, before uh, me mechanization, uh, cities mainly for walking uh, and maybe some uh, animal drawn transport or horseback or camels and other modes of transport in that sense. And then the development of urban planning that created more spacious streets and squares for allowing, um, uh, for example, horses and carriages to use the streets. Uh, and then the evolution of technology, uh, creating new opportunities for 
novel urban forms such as um, uh, the, the tramway based uh, uh, linear city uh, here, uh, Ciudad Lineal, um, or and eventually uh, multimodal uh, street based uh, uh, cities, multi level and uh, multimodal cities, and also the retrofitting of some cities uh, is in this case. Uh, here at Leeds being retrofitted with uh, motorways in the 1960s and 1970s. And it reminds us that of the impact that say one new technology could have. So if, if, you, re if you reorient the whole city towards one mode of transport, you can end up with a radical uh, redistribution of, of spaces and structures and the structure of accessibility uh, and so on. And it just feels, it feels as if um, uh, automotive, uh, um, automated vehicles uh, uh, and so-called driverless cars could be presenting us with new opportunities, as we've just seen, to refurbish and redesign uh, and reinvent our, our, our cities uh, for uh, these, if we, if we call them new modes of, of transport, if you like. I guess uh, there are some precursors to this. I guess people in the last 20 or so years, people have increasingly thought, well, maybe we could adapt our cities to smaller vehicles or less harmful uh, vehicles. Uh, for example, could we have more compact cars, compact cars for compact cities? Um, and perhaps experiments in how we could have different kinds of transport. So th this is from probably 10 years ago, more than 10 years ago. Um, uh, which was envisaging poss a possible divergence in different kinds of cars, so that we don't just have one kind of car, but we have different kinds of cars that go on different kinds of network. Some might be interurban cars that travel on the more strategic roads, and some more like the compact city cars that travel on their own network of uh, smaller uh, streets. Um, and, and as we've seen, automated vehicles also uh, pre present uh, many opportunities for, for example, door-to-door -door journeys, perhaps less need for parking, more space for other modes and other non-transport non activities, uh, perhaps higher speed uh, movement in platoons, maybe uh, vehicles running on tracks in tunnels, and all of these things uh, stimulate additional thoughts about what future urban forms uh, might be. Uh, and we've seen some uh, very uh, interesting and awesome examples that have been really thought through carefully in, in this work. Uh, not just the images as we see here, but lots of uh, very detailed calculations and measurements and, and drawings as, as we have already seen. So it's great to see this uh, work. I couldn't help also thinking of the possible future the th of the third dimension as well, um, uh, and the, the prospects of possible use of personal aerial vehicles and what these, those might do uh, for cities as well, al allowing direct uh, routes uh, traveling through three-dimensional space independent of the, the configuration on the ground, uh, allowing landing on the top of buildings um, and perhaps even at entry points part way up the buildings. Um, so, for example, uh, instead of just vehicles plugging into the, the bottom of buildings, as is normally the case, maybe the, the, the ground floor and maybe the basement, um, we can also have landing on the top of the city, oh, sorry, the top of the buildings. Um, we could also imagine what if we could enter the sides of buildings, we open up vertical in, interfaces uh, up the sides of buildings uh, and eventually perhaps even a, a ver vertical grid. Um, which opens up more thoughts of three-dimensional cities. Um, eventually you start wondering about space stations and all sorts of uh, future cities based on movement paths uh, floating through three-dimensionally through uh, the urban form. Uh, of course that's perhaps some, some distance in the future, um, but we can also go low-tech as well as high-tech and if we think of human powered vehicles and bringing things back to the, the human scale, there, there's increased interest, of course, in these smaller uh, modes of transport, small wheeled modes of micro mobility. Um, and these could be part of another kind of future uh, where there's more use of shared spaces and there's more use of uh, active travel. Um, uh, and 
even and although we tend to think of these as slow modes, um, there's no reason that some of these modes couldn't actually be relatively fast. You could have high speed roller blades, for example, uh, that could even be faster than normal congested traffic flows. You could have maybe dedicated rights of way, um, uh, you know, roller blade arcades, maybe. Uh, this could be an alternative form of transport that's clean, healthy and relatively fast. And by being non-polluting, in a sense, could be suitable and adaptable for the use in interior streets. So we could imagine our urban forms reconfigured uh, if we imagine rollerbladers traveling along these, these um, corridors and different parts, different urban forms. We could even have uh, a human powered component in future three dimensional cities for, for human locomotion. I think that's m mainly all and the main things I, I really wanted to say is really just to is just to, in a sense, put the work on um, uh, sort of autonomous vehicles in, in, a, in, in the context of the excitement of new technologies and the different ways in which different technologies come together. And I think I think it was Isaac Asimov who once said, I think, that um, from centuries, people imagined people landing on the moon. Uh, and, and for centuries, people imagined some kind of television, some kind of apparatus at which you could see at a distance. Um, but, but no one, he said, I think, well, no one had uh, imagined the, the simultaneous event of the live transmission of television pictures as someone stood on the moon for the first time. And this becomes another aspect of the, I think, of the excitement of uh, the, the different technologies, because it's the convergence of technologies. Um, I can remember again in the old days, uh, once upon a time when people imagined uh, telephones, mobile telephones, the, or to people talking into their bracelets, and it was once science fiction. Um, and also the idea of a telephone that you, you could see into, like a, a video phone, people imagining old fashioned telephones with a screen in front of them. Um, so we can already see that these things are already happened. You know, a mobile phone and a video phone is, is one and the same thing. It's also a pocket TV. It's also a laptop PC. These things all come together, add in the internet, add in the Zoom technology. You can then use it anywhere. You can use it on a train. You can use it in an automated vehicle. Um, the automated vehicle, if you don't need to drive it, you can sit there. It's a mobile office. If it's a mobile office, it's a mobile urban form. As, uh, as Stephen said earlier, we're bringing the flows together. The flows and the urban forms are coming together. So I, I kind of end with just imagining, well, what if we put together, as well as our conventional transport, the automated vehicles, plus human powered vehicles, plus personal aerial vehicles, and then what do we get? Well, I'll leave that question for you. I would suggest it's exciting times ahead. So thank you very much. Thanks so much, Stephen. What a lovely, um, um, well, expansion certainly of the of the uh, the framework that Tandy sketched. Um, the convergence point, I think, is very well made, and some of those images which looked a bit sci-fi. In fact, I've seen bits of Singapore that look quite like that already. And what's so interesting about that, I can imagine convergence of this discussion with colleagues who are working on dense and green environments, sort of vertical public spaces and so on, which also integrates with discussions about cooling and heat, uh, heat island effect and so on. So I think it's uh, it looks sci-fi, but not really that much. In fact, it's quite impressively uh, uh, real. So thanks again. Um, now we turn to, uh, to Zurich uh, and we invite Professor Kai Axhausen to make his contribution. Kai, the floor is yours. Thank you. And thank you for the invite and thank you to allow me to contribute to this discussion. Let me share my screen. While Kai is doing that, I'll remind you uh, that we would welcome questions or comments or lines of inquiry, which we'll come back to in a moment after Kai's presentation. Okay, um, what I want to do, and therefore widen the discussion a bit, is to remind ourselves that transport planning and by extension, urban design, have a couple of basic dilemmas. And 
I want to highlight one technology which is currently quite vividly discussed in the context of the COVID shock. And it might have long-term implications, uh, which is worth picking up and maybe deciding it's nonsense or maybe deciding that's the way to go forward. Um, okay, what is the basic dilemma for transit policy? The basic dilemma is that we have been investing in accessibility, i.e. the ability to interact with others, either for commercial or for social purposes, for at least the last 250 years. And there hasn't really been a Western society or industrializing society which hasn't done that. Um, the effect of that and the success of that has been spectacular. As we all know, when we just look outside the window, when we remember that uh, in Switzerland, for example, you have about 700 cars per thousand inhabitants. Now, why do we do that? We do that because we increase productivity with it. Productivity both in a social sense, but also in an economic sense. On the economic side, there has been quite a few studies now which show that increasing accessibility increases productivity of the firm, which in turn should enable the firm to pay higher wages. I'm not going to talk about the, the recent crisis of that transmission, uh, but it has in the past. Now, this productivity through the higher wages enables us to live fuller lives and then also use the money and the resources to interact in all the things outside of the economic sphere. Now, this is what we want to do, and this is what societies worldwide are doing. Now, the problem we have, and that has become only clear vividly in the last two or three decades, that this investment in accessibility obviously encourages car ownership. Clearly, if you make the car easier to use, if you make it faster, if you increase its range, it becomes more attractive. And given that through the productivity gains, cars have effectively become not dirt cheap, but in comparison to historical numbers, dirt cheap, there's no surprise that we buy all those cars. Reversely, the moment we have invested in the second most expensive consumer good, but for our own houses, uh, our commitment to the transit use, to share our travel goes down. Which that obviously has all the attendant problems on the roads. Now, this link has been clear for a while. And so since the 60s, societies have maintained an active program of making transit better and cheaper, not everywhere, but in most societies around the world. Now, what recently has become much more to the focus is that all this accessibility increases vehicle miles traveled. And given that we haven't switched to electric vehicles yet, and we haven't switched to a clean production of electricity, we produce CO2 with a vengeance doing that. And that has become clear that we can't sustain that. Now, we all know about the political difficulties of getting us out of that trap. And it's not clear whether we'd be fast enough to do that, uh, given the political resistance of doing that. But in principle, this is a further dilemma. And finally, accessibility supp supports sprawl. Why? Because with this increasing income we have, the second thing we buy is not speed, which we buy by buying cars, but is buying more space. Now, all of you are aware enough of how dismal the housing conditions were in the 19th century. And in many countries, in particular in the developing world, were still just 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So sprawl is enabled by accessibility because at the same time as we become richer, we don't like 
change anymore. In particular, not change after we invested massive amounts of money into housing, because we are all afraid that any change will make that house less valuable and therefore destroy our life savings. Now, and again, sprawl produces vehicle miles traveled and therefore more CO2. Now, this setting is next to impossible to break. And very few societies have managed to do that, at least to come to grips with it. Singapore is a prime example with its massive and radical policy of limiting car ownership, not so much car use, but car ownership. But no other society has gone there yet. And it will be interesting to see what will go first, uh, car use, car ownership, or CO2 emissions from the cars. Okay, so this is the dilemma. Now, why do I think there might be a way out, or is there a way out of this dilemma, which is not pressing? Now, let me restate that just to make it clear that we talk about the dimensions and the variables by which we influence accessibility. Accessibility, as we capture it in the professional field, is a joint measure of the density of opportunities we have to participate in life, either economic and or social, and the speed or travel time uh, involved. Now, density of opportunity is generally proportional to wealth because if you have a highly dense environment, normally land prices go up and therefore you require relatively more income or inherited wealth to live there. Now, obviously there's all kinds of things uh, which societies do to make that not direct linear relationships, but generally speaking, that's true. Generally, density of opportunity is a producer of spatial inequality because where there is dense wealth concentrated, those with less wealth can't live. So you spread the less wealthy away from the rich. And we all know this process if we look at places like London or New York uh, or any other rich city. And then finally, this density is inherently unsustainable because it requires enormous amounts of energy to be sustained. Uh, so it's a very precarious situation we have there. Now, I'm not gonna talk about land use planning and urban design because that's not really my expertise, but let's talk about the transport side. Accessibility grows with a redu reduction in generalized cost. Generalized cost is mostly travel time. Okay, to some extent, it has to do with the cost of travel, the monetary cost of travel, but generally we're talking about speed. Now, the easiest way in societies which don't want to increase density of the urban area is to foster car travel and car use to reduce that speed, increase that speed and reduce the travel time. And that's what we have done. Now, the other way in which we can reduce travel times, in particular in congested areas, and I'll say a bit more about that in a second, is to use joint large vehicles. And for congested situation, it's the only way in which we can maintain a reasonable level of speed. Singapore is a great example of that because while it has by now stopped the growth of the car fleet, more or less, it is still investing heavily in public transport to allow a certain limit, certain level of speed. Now, the disadvantage of large jointly used vehicles is that they are inherently slower than individual motorized vehicles because you have to brake, you have to let people in and out. You have to have brakes for the drivers. So that's the downside. But now, the last 10, 15 years, e-bikes kind of are popping up as a possible alternatives. Modern e-bikes are incredibly fast. 40, 50 kilometers are easily reached 
If they are e-bikes, you can type them in into uh, clean energy. They use a lot less space than cars. They are obviously a bit dangerous because they are fast, but they are potential there. And it might be worth thinking about e-bikes as essentially bicycles on steroids as a way forward in some of our discussions. Now, let's look at a couple of other things. Sorry. One thing which I want to remind you of is urban areas as built have maximum capacities for moving people. Uh, in a large study, two PhD students at the EVT uh, measured these capacity limits um, for urban areas. Unfortunately, we couldn't get data for Singapore, so we don't have Singaporean data, but this involves cities like London, LA, many German cities, Swiss cities, uh, Tokyo and others. Now, what do you see here just to help? What they did, oh, sorry, what we did, what they did was to measure the densities of cars in three minute intervals. They measured the density of buses also in three minute intervals and they measured the density of bicycles for not as many cities as the others cases, but for some. And then in the third dimension, we look at the number of cars which flow over that street. And they did this for essentially all streets in an urban area which had measurement devices aggregated them together to come up with this joint measurement for a whole area, let's say of 10, 15 square kilometers, so substantial chunks of cities. And what you can see that there is a clear relationship between car density, bus density, and the total flow of cars, which the city can move. So we have to make a trade-off between the number of buses versus the number of cars. Now, when you remember that buses move, let's say 60 to 100 people versus cars moving two or one, it's obviously more important to move buses than cars if you want to move many passengers. The same is true if you look at bicycles and cars. There's a similar trade-off because cars and bicycles use the available urban road space, which you can't normally increase very easily or fast or cheaply. So we have this maximum capacity in which we have to live. So any decision is a fight between the different modes for the limited road space. Now, the second thing is, is to think about speeds. Now, why do I show COVID numbers? Um, as part of an ongoing study, uh, we are tracking about now about 700 people in Switzerland uh, with a GPS, uh, with a GPS of their smartphones using uh, a standard tracking app, uh, which is standard in the transport domain. Using this data, we can calculate this door-to-door -door speeds of our tracked persons. And you can see that there's a clear impact of distance, which makes sense because the further you go away, the more you use faster modes or faster roads. And the second thing which you see is that in kind of urban distances below 20 kilometers, the speed which we see here, which involves obviously some train, some motorways, is only about 30 kilometers an hour. And we haven't looked at the shorter distances where the speeds go down to 15 kilometers or lower. As a side, clearly the lockdown was car drivers and travelers paradise because the speeds went up enormously as all the demand disappeared and competition disappeared on the road. And what I wanted to highlight is this relatively low level of speed for short distances and even lower speeds for even shorter distances. Now, why do I think that the bicycle and by extension, the e-bike 
might be a way forward. Now, this is again the COVID data, which I just talked about. And here I show you the change in the person kilometers traveled in comparison to a before period in the fall of last year uh, over the last seven months. There is obviously in our data and in other data sets as well, but not in all, an enormous increase in bicycle use over the first half of the year. The numbers went down as the weather turned colder, uh, but it's still a substantial increase on the person kilometers traveled for, in comparison to before. What the main story though is, is that public transport has an ongoing loss of usage. And that's true just about everywhere where data is being published. Why is that happening? I think there are two reasons. And we are talking massive. This is 40, 50% in our data and similar numbers in similar data sets. I think it's two things. One is a reluctance of people to share space for extended periods of time with strangers in vehicles with less than perfect air conditioning. Plus, it is the ability of many people, in particular longer distance commuters, to work from home. Uh, longer distance commuters generally are higher earning commuters. So the general will have better spatial conditions at home. So working from home is easier for them. They generally work in what is called the knowledge industries, which again, uh, enables them to work from home. They generally don't have to be at a counter in a hospital uh, where they have to be physically be there. So these people are missing on the trains. Car use is essentially back to normal, which is interesting given that 10% in Switzerland, 10, 50% of Switzerland don't work from home, so they don't travel or not as much as before. So we have a situation in which Large vehicles are not used as much anymore. And even on the local scale, the trams and the buses. And cycles gained a lot of popularity, which obviously raises the question, is there a chance to reformulate the urban traffic environment in one in which the bicycle has a much bigger role? Now, this has been requested by bicycle advocates forever. But they were always rebuffed because the trade-offs were deemed to be unfavorable. Just to remind you here, this trade-off was obviously not measured, but the planners and the engineers knew that there was a trade-off and they just didn't want to get in there. Now, in a situation where trains aren't used anymore, and we clearly don't want to encourage the car, given its space requirements and its CO2 emissions, the bicycle might be an option. Now, the question is, how would such an e-bike city look? In particular, if it's not just a dense city, but a slightly sprawled city, because the other thing we have all learned is that many people are reconsidering uh, their preferences for dense urban areas. All those people who find that working from home in a too small flat is just unbearable. They want out and that will probably continue to push people out in, in further sprawl. Now, but what is what would such an e-bike city look like? And I can't tell what the impacts would be because we haven't done the calculations. There isn't obviously no, ex no example. So what would we need to do if you want an e-bike or just a bike city have, which is safe and comfortable for the bicyclists? Um, what would they need? Clearly there would be, need a massive reallocation of the more or less constant road space to the bikes. <laughs> 
and the, and the e-bikes. And given the speed differential between e-bikes and bikes, we have to worry about whether we can put them in the same space. Now, given that people should be encouraged to walk, we have to reconsider the pro provision of walking space as well, as we still need express buses for longer distances. Why express buses? Because the slow buses, which we currently have in many cities, which stop too often, are just too slow to be attractive. In particular, if you want to make this an alternative to the car. So we need to have at least one localized urban mode, which is reasonably fast. And we can't expect everybody to have as much money as Singapore to build MRTs everywhere. And then finally, okay. to, we might uh, need space. Time. Yep, I'd finish uh, in a second. Wrapping up. Okay. Um, we need space for the golf carts to get people to the stop. Now, finally, what else do we need? We obviously need to improve accessibility for the e-bikes. That means new bridges to cross rivers, railways, etc. We need space for e-bike and e-scooter parking. We need maybe further investment in heavy rail to maintain a certain speed. We will probably need heavy subsidies into the reliability and frequency of services because they traditionally don't pay. And we need bus priority everywhere to make them move fast enough. And with that, I'm done. And if you want further information about the COVID study, here it is. And the, the rest of the work of the Institute can be found at this address. Thanks very much, Kai. Um, that was wonderful. Um, it's a really beautiful deep dive. And also, I like the way we're moving out into uh, social science and economics, uh, which keeps it as a properly urban, uh, urban study. We've got some really nice questions, um, which tend to be a bit more specific. But since they've been posted for a while, I think we should go back to those and then see if we can engineer a discussion between the three of you, because I think there's some wonderful links. Um, the other thing I thought I might try, is Anne Feenstra, uh, Feenstra still online? Would you like to ask the question yourself? This is a completely open Zoom call, so anybody... So yeah, sure. Yeah. Are you there, Anne? Yeah. Um, thank you so much for the, uh, the presentations. Um, my question was for Tanvi after the super block. Uh, the model that you made, uh, what is approximately the amount of uh, population and, and the density of uh, that measured area that you do for the uh, study. Thanks a lot. Uh, the, the super block is, uh, the dimension would be 800 meter by 800 meter for one block. And the density is 70 dwelling units per hectare. So within a block in Singapore, you have one uh, uh, neighborhood and that's about 6,000 to 7,000 dwelling units. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Thank you. This is a really key question though you asked because we, as, as Kai was showing away, the question density is very looming large here. There's some other things that Tanvi did, which is locating the work specifically in Singapore, which, which frames that density question. But Kai, what was your reaction to, uh, to Tanvi's superblock proposal, particularly in relation to your point about density and uh, accessibility? I think the superblock is one possibility. And I think if I remember the thesis right, these were large super blocks. So they had, I think, what was it? 20,000 residents inside the block? One block is six to 7,000, uh, 7, yeah. Okay, which uh, is large units, enough. So 20,000, yeah. Which is large enough to sustain most of urban amenities in forms of the kind of run of the mill shopping plus schools, plus et cetera, plus even 20,000, you could even have a hospital inside that block. So I think that is a, is a good idea because it essentially takes out the need for not motorized travel completely, more or less. All of this can be reached by walking. Now, the interesting question is, which obviously Tanvi couldn't look at because the pandemic wasn't really on our radar or her radar when she did all these designs, how this is now currently acceptable under those health conditions. Now, we can hope that with the, with the vaccine, 
hopefully arriving next year uh, and then rolled out in the coming years, those worries goes away. And then the super blocks are one way forward. Mm. And maybe I could just riff on that uh, back to you, Stephen. What, what's your reaction to Kai's work? Are you seeing similar sorts of graphs, you know, with the spike of, of bike, of bike uh, use? use? I, uh, yeah, I think it's a, it's a fascinating, um, it's, it's almost like a controlled experiment, isn't it? I mean, it's, it's almost like, you know, if you remove this part, let's see, like, if the roads were all free, uh, free to use, uh, that's to say uncongested, what happens to the different modes of transport and how people um, behave. I haven't been monitoring closely the, 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 the transport side of it, although colleagues, um, Matthew Carmona and colleagues in our uh, department have done a COVID study relating to, a COVID related study relating to um, things like distance people are prepared to walk uh, to green space in neighbourhoods and so on. Uh, I need to dig out the reference myself, but uh, he gave a presentation recently where, where it was an ability, there was an ability to kind of fine tune the, the, the preparedness to walk to green space. Mm -hmm. So the, the, I think most the overall findings were, let's say, roughly what one might expect in terms of how far how you know pe uh, uh, people's life comfortable with uh, if you have a garden that's better if, if you know if you have a, even a balcony that's better than nothing um, and the various kinds of uh, dwelling and housing scenarios um, you know lower density was better high rise was worse and so on many of these factors were um, in some senses not surprising but the interesting part was maybe fine tuning some of the details so one of the findings that came out of that was I think that, you know, 15 minutes was too too much. I mean, people talk about 15 minute city. I mean, but but the idea that if people are going to walk to a green space, they, it needs to be much, you know shorter than and, and to facilities, it needs to be shorter than 15 minutes. It needs to be more like five five to ten. Now I haven't looked at the detailed written work myself yet, so I shouldn't say too much. But but I mean, it's interesting that these things are being. Uh, being tested and kind of monitored to see, you know, how, like how do people behave, to, to speak more generally, like when I was saying control experiment, like how do people behave when the, the roads are, are wide open, uh, you know, how, and, and I was talking to some colleagues yesterday who were talking about how they're loving and enjoying traveling on empty commuter trains, you know, so, you know, how, how, how but, but that won't be forever because, you know, <laughs> they'll stop running them if they're too empty and so on. Yes, thanks a lot. Um, I would maybe just to close, close this little bracket, you all, both of you in a way, Kai and Stephen, have focused on the mode of transport um, in, in different ways. Kai on, on um, electric bikes and Stephen, you introduced a whole range of, you know, small and large cars and, 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 and thereafter much more diversity. So Tanvi, in a way that's slightly beyond the scope of your thesis, but you you were still looking at different kind of modes of transport. Um, what what was your reaction to some of those those threads? And would you simply say it's beyond the scope of the thesis, or how how did you manage that? No, in fact, when I began my research, I was uh, looking at purely autonomous vehicles. Uh, and it becomes very clear very quickly that it's not just one technology like e-bikes or aerial mobility or autonomous vehicles that we must focus on as urban planners or designers. It's the convergence that Stephen talked about, the convergence of these things coming together. So what I'm trying to explore is basically how these technologies can converge, support each other, and then the impacts they would have on urban form and vice versa, especially understanding the structural relationships between an, a design move and what it means for transport flows over a period of time. And this temporal understanding is important for urban designers, uh, regardless of the technology. Mm, super. Okay, um, let's go back to the boards. Um, as I say, um, Alex Era is a wonderful colleague, once of Singapore. Are you here, Alex? Hi, nice to see you again. Do you want to ask the question? My lecture room, <laughs> because I made this part of a lecture um, I'm doing with my students here at FHNW in Basel. 
so my question was directed to Tanvi, but also in a sense to Kai, um, whether quick or sketch as I think as you call it now, does include network performance measure or accessibility measures also for pedestrians and cyclists? Uh, in and the case of my simulation, uh, like I said, in the conclusion that I'm looking at transport modeling to incorporate more fine grained description. But uh, currently, in the current form, uh, how I did this was to in increase the tolerance of walking for pedestrians given certain design experiments. So there was a previous study that you did, Alex, on walkability in Singapore and people's tolerance for walking based on the speed of traffic or uh, greenery or uh, the level of activity around. So we used that those metrics to kind of weight um, and then change the tolerance for people. So in a super block where uh, you have shorter routes, you can also have a higher tolerance for walking because there's no traffic. So that was my workaround, but this needs to be a much more fine grained description uh, for to understand how urban design is impacting transport flows. Mm. Hi, do you want to take a go at it? Yep. In, yes, Alex, in principle, we can calculate all of this. Um, now, is it done must. as a standard? We must. <laughs> as a standard, not, not really. But it also then raises the issue, which is one reason why probably many groups working with Matsum are reluctant, because you have to then improve the description of both the pedestrian and the cycle net network substantially. And the, the, the data work involved is something which people shy away from. But I agree with you, it's no excuse. And we should add that in particular if we are doing detailed um, level work. But Alex, why don't you, why don't you make the case? It sounds like you, you have quite a clear answer to your own question. Yes, of course, it must be included. We can't argue that we want to have a bike city and the e-bike city and don't do network measures on those accessibilities. And um, think about of a super block that works very well for the cars that can drive 60, 70 kilometers an hour along the major roads. But it's a huge obstruction to pedestrian and cyclists that need to cross those roads. And yes, there is 6,000, 7,000 people within one um, section. But that's highly restrictive. If uh, my, I don't know, union meeting is at the other block, I still need to go there. And I might not want to get into a car, but just take my e-bike that brings me faster. So I need to think about the connectivity. And connectivity is only addressed if you include the network measures. And there are ways, and I agree with Kai, it's difficult. Um, to acqu acquire all the necessary information about that like, comfort and safety levels of bicycle and, and pedestrian links. It's just simply that we something we need to do. We also did it for the cars. Mm. I mean, the amount of research that went into um, deriving um, flow density and density like speed graphs, we must also address this now in research for cyclists and pedestrians. And we started with this and we need to continue with it. Kai, you've already answered that. Do you want to come back? I just want to say, to say yes, Alex is right. Um, but the cost, there are cost implications, and we just will have to bear those costs to essentially inform any decisions. Like, for example, if you wanted to make use of any tool, or Matsum in particular, to look at the impacts of an e-bike city, um, you would need to have that information to make credible Mm -hmm. results. So anybody who's online still and is contemplating doing, doing a PhD, uh, here's a beautiful topic. It's just been scoped right in front of you. Um, Kai, you've already answered this question, but this is a question from Mark Selby. I think it, it, it would be really nice if we open this question up. It concerns freight. Mark, are you still online? And would you like I to am, yes. Like to ask uh, the question publicly. Okay, firstly, can I say thank you to everyone? Great presentations, really excellent. Um, my interest here is that I'm focusing on transportation in areas beyond major conurbations. And this is terminology within the UK, so outside major smart cities. In some respects, I'm more interested in dumb towns than smart cities. But we have a problem with the definition of rural peri-urban. One of the things that we've been looking at very closely is 
clearly behavior patterns during COVID and during the pandemic. And one of the things that's been extraordinary here in the UK is that the growth of online retail and deliveries has been considerable. Many of the studies that I'm seeing tend to be focusing on the movement of people. And yet during this um, pandemic, we've seen an explosion in parcel freight. I mean, in June in Mark, the UK- let me, let me jump in there, Mark. You, uh, you nailed uh, this key new theme. I'm gonna ask each person to respond because I think you've captured that very beautifully. So maybe starting with you, Kai, the question of freight, goods, trans non-people transport. Okay, we couldn't cover it in the GPS uh, panel, but we did ask these questions. We had a student who actually went to Singapore to do a survey on e-commerce and repeated the study in Switzerland. We asked that also in follow-on questions to our panel, me panel members. And yes, the number of packages delivered have gone up substantially. And I think you're absolutely right that we need to pay more attention to this because total travel is not only the travel which people produce leaving the home, but it's all the people who come to the home. And in the pandemic and probably in the future, e-commerce, all the other services which can be delivered at home, let's say a barber which just comes by and cuts your hair, um, all of these things will have to be included and looked at more carefully uh, in the future. Thanks a lot. Stephen, um, in your convergence framework, what's the role of freight and, well, you're, you're missing up. Well, I was, I'm going to just go in a slightly different direction and say, um, I think it's also a matter of working out the kinds of, like the spatial pattern of those journeys as well. I mean, obviously when you say it, um, but it's going back to something I think Tanvi said earlier, like it's not just about the vehicle technology per se, say, or what, what is in the vehicle, you know, person, person versus freight, but it's like the idea of, you know, like a, a, a traditional car journey might be point to point or door to door. And then a, a public transport journey will, well, the vehicle will, will move along a, a series of, of pick up and drop off points. And then a freight, well, there could be different kinds of freight, patterns of freight journey uh, or movements, like, like the post, the postal delivery might go from house to house, uh, uh, whereas a, 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 deli a delivery from a, a, a package might be more a hub and spoke or, um, you know, there could be different ways in which those could be um, uh, spatially manifested. That is not some, it's not so much to do with the technology, but it's how it's organized. And I just wonder, thinking off the top of my head, like, could there be a, could there be a role for a, a freight equivalent of shared vehicles shared vehicle journeys you know where you know different operators use a share a vehicle to share packages from different people to minimize travel i don't know um you know that we need to bring all these things together like the technology the scheduling the payment the routing and so on and so on lovely very nice Tanvi, the floor is yours. Um, you don't have to talk about freight since you're the opening speaker, but I would be interested to know, what do you mean? Uh, uh, other, yeah. other forms of mobility in your story? I did not consider freight, but it's such an important question. I also realized the, uh, after the lockdown and the amount of traffic you have because of the increased uh, deliveries. But one of the things I did consider was uh, something, what, what Stephen talked about, mobile urban form. So not just the deliveries or uh, merchandise coming to your house, but this uh, temporary uh, space where let's say there's an autonomous vehicle that's also a mobile library or it's a mobile convenience store and it parks in a certain place and that's where you have a temporary shop or a library and people come and congregate and leave. So that type of temporal activity to me is of very of high interest because not only is it a um, logistic flow, but it's also creating a new type of uh, ephemeral uh, urban space. Hmm. Thank you. So that's a really nice uh, point to conclude on. I think it's it's actually quite realistic. Um, and it's also re re reinforces uh, Stephen's point about, about convergence, which I find is a, a really urban, urban thing to say, uh, as opposed to disciplinary sort of silos. And it reminds us about, about uh, Kai's larger theoretical framework. Um, about the role of density and travel and the e economics of agglomeration, um, particularly through the lens of this very 
convenient, albeit devastating uh, experiment that we're, we're living through. So with that, um, I want to conclude. I want to thank everybody for their questions. Uh, there's some lovely compliments as well. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you very much for those. Uh, there's a question about whether the material will be available. We will do our best to kind of package this up and, and make it available. So keep a lookout on our website for the next, uh, next week, perhaps. Um, but I want to thank uh, from Autumnal uh, Zurich, Kai Axhausen, it, it's wonderful to have you here again, albeit virtually. Uh, Stephen Marshall, also I assume Autumnal uh, Hampstead, uh, and then here in tropical uh, Bami, Singapore, it's, it's good evening for me and uh, good evening from uh, Dr. Tanvi Maheshwari. Thank you very much. Bye-bye, everybody.